thought leadership from PwC. Of course, there will always be someone who has something to say. Yeah. You will never fulfill all expectations, but you need to have a rational way of explaining where you put the bar. That's what is important. Hello. Today we're continuing our CSRD Spotlight series, focused on giving you the latest that you need to know about the EU's mandatory sustainability reporting rules. This is PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. Some topics in sustainability reporting tend to require new paradigms in order to understand, especially for preparers coming from a traditional financial reporting background. And a topic for many of us that's perhaps one of the biggest paradigm shifts is the focus of today's podcast, double materiality. To understand what this means in the context of CSRD and to provide some practical insights on how companies can effectively perform these assessments, I'm happy to be joined today by Cecile San Martin, PwC's Global ESG Assurance Leader. Our conversation included a look at not only the basic requirements of double materiality within the ESRS, but also provides some practical examples to demonstrate how different fact patterns may interact with the double materiality guidance. With that, here's our conversation. Cecile, welcome to the podcast. So nice to have you on today. And since you're a new guest to the podcast, I thought it'd be nice just to start out for our audience if you can just share a little bit about your background and your role at the firm. Sure. Hi, Heather. Uh, bonjour. I'm a partner from PwC France, um, financial auditor by background uh, for a number of our French headquartered international groups, which led me to extend my assurance practice to sustainability assurance several years ago, as maybe you know that in France, we already implemented a regulatory requirement for limited assurance over sustainability reporting for our listed uh, groups. So this led me to my current role as PwC Global Sustainability Assurance Leader. You can imagine that we have a very intensive activity with our audit client at the moment around CSRD in anticipation of the coming uh, assurance requirements uh, and specifically many questions around their double materiality assessment. And it's interesting, your reference to limited assurance, because we've been talking on the podcast about NFRD. So is this under NFRD that exactly, you're already giving under NFRD. limited You have assurance. a few EU territories, uh, France, Spain, and Italy, who already requested uh, this sustainability reporting to be audited with limited assurance. So before we get into our true topic of today, which is double materiality, I have to ask you then, for companies that are going to be new to limited assurance, what are... What's a, a lesson learned that you would share? Well, first, I will have to say that CSRD is a brand new world, even for previous NFRD reporters. Very the scope, fair the point. extent, yeah. the complexity has nothing com compared to previous reporting. Uh, the second point I would say is anticipation and the right cooperation within the different streams within the entity, the different teams, uh, it's really a multiple competence project. And it's not only the thing of a sustainability team. Yeah, definitely a lot to think about and a big change from financial reporting. And I think, again, one of the things that people are finding most challenging about CSRD is this concept of double materiality and how how that should be approached. And for at least many companies that we are working with, they've gotten through scoping, which is a, a big question for some non-EU companies. But for both EU and non-EU companies, I think right now is a, a big time for double materiality. So maybe just starting that off, since it's a new concept, what can you kind of share in terms of what we mean when we use that phrase? Sure. So it's the foundation of what information will be reported Double materiality, it's the accumulation of two materiality concepts, impact materiality and financial materiality. So first, what is impact materiality? It is what matters to the planet and society. It is also referred to as the inside-out impact that a company uh, has on sustainability matters. 
impact. It can be actual or potential. It can be positive or negative. It can be over the short, medium or long term time horizons. Company may have mitigation actions around a negative impact, but they should usually assess its growth and not net. And also important to mention that it includes impacts connected with the entity on operations, its product and services, but also its value chain. That's very important mm-hmm. to include all your business relationships. So that's for impact materiality. Now, financial materiality is something which is often easier to, to understand. It's what matters to investors and creditors. So something we all know very well from the financial environment. So it's all sustainability topics affect the future development, performance and position of the company, what we also call outside in. Um, it can be a risk or opportunity that affect or could reasonably be expected to affect the entity financial position, its cash flows, access to finance, cost of capital. It can also be on short, medium or long term, like impact materiality. It's only prospective. And so the double materiality addresses the full spectrum of either and both impact and financial perspective, really um, resulting in a holistic lens of what matters to the broader stakeholders of a company. So, Cecile, before you go on, let me ask a question that I've gotten and didn't give the best explanation, I don't think, so maybe you can do better. This concept of inside out and outside in, how, what, how would you describe what we mean when we say inside out? So, let's take a simple example of GHG, which is something that exists in all sustainability reporting standards. The inside out, so the impact, it's... For instance, the emission that you are generating by the entity production process or through your value chain, which negatively contribute to climate change. But you can also have positive impact linked to GHG inside out. For instance, if your entity is selling a technology that is reducing GHG emissions or is developing nature-based solutions for carbon capture and storage. So that's the inside out. And the outside in the financial impact is that you can have risk of future cash outflows, for instance, with the development of regulations around carbon pricing mechanism, uh, the increased cost to purchase emission rights, investment in new technology to reduce your emission to comply with regulation, or uh, cost to buy carbon credits to meet your public net zero commitment. You- yeah, so actually, it's a great example because I was. We've just been doing some podcasts on taxonomy, and one of the examples that we talked about there was someone who manufactures electric vehicles, and so you are creating emissions from your own uh, manufacturing processes, but then overall, you're contributing to lowering of emissions because then if someone's using your electric vehicles, so that would be an example of the type of activity that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. All right. Sure. That's very helpful. And then uh, the other question that we've gotten is for so many people, impact materiality is a new concept, but actually that same concept is included in the GRI mm-hmm. standards. And so we'll get more into this later, but are you seeing people referring maybe to work that was previously done as part of their GRI work? For sure, for sure. Um, well, the, the, the definition of impact materiality is the same between CSRD and GRI. CSRD leverage on what was done by GRI. So uh, it's not a full, full alignment because mm-hmm. the CSRD uh, regulation imposed some a few difference, but as far as possible, they they really got alignment. So, GRI reporters have a very good basis to make their impact assessment according to to CSRD. So then they just have to marry together their uh, impact and with the financial. financial. That's right. Yeah. All exactly. right. So I jumped in there, and I think you were going to finish explaining to us then sort of the how we think about double materiality yeah. and the components. Yeah, maybe w- one point that I wanted to to explain, because this is a term that we will use a lot. It's yes. IROs, I-R-O's. So IROs is really the, the, the combination of what results. I is for impact, so what result from the impact materiality, and R and O is its risk and opportunities, which is what results from the financial materiality assessment. So you will see that we, we will talk a lot about 
Yes, actually, in my next question, maybe we can go through some of that. So why don't we talk about then, we talked about GHG, and I do think for most people, that is maybe the easiest place to get their head around some of this, because we've been talking about it for quite some time. But are there any other examples then that you could give of these impact risks and opportunities or that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Let's take another example in the environment, ESG environment yeah. category. Uh, let's take the example of a company um, which is manufacturing beverage and the assessment of whether water stress is a material topic uh, for this company from a, a double materiality point of view. From an impact point of view, we could say that there may be material negative impact. For instance, if your production process captures too much water, creating scarcity for local communities or modifying habitats for endangered marine Mm -hmm. spaces, you could also have positive impact because you create employment for local community. So that's from the impact point of view. And from financial point of view, a few examples of risks, uh, the inability to produce during severe dry periods, reducing your cash flows, new regulations that create compliance costs or needs to challenge alternative or to organize alternative sourcing, uh, higher transportation costs or investment cash out related to that. So let me ask you a question about this water stress example in particular, and this is very near to me because I'm from California where we have a lot of water issues. And I think your example really rings um, true because you have this idea of agriculture takes a huge amount of water, Mm -hmm. but you're also producing food, employment and everything else. And so are you seeing, how are you seeing companies grapple with this combination of it's, it's creating an issue, but at the same time, there is a benefit. How are you seeing people balance those two? Well, in fact, it, it, it's not so much a question of balancing rather than being transparent around both. You, you don't have to add the plus and the minus uh-huh. and say at the end, it's zero and I don't disclose anything. You have to disclose both the positive elements and the negative elements. And I guess this is where one of the things we've been spending a lot of time talking about uh, for non-EU headquarter companies, they have some option in terms of reporting, in terms of do their individual um, subsidiaries report that are in scope or do you use a holding company or even your global ultimate parent. And I do think this is an interesting point that looking even at maybe an individual subsidiary, you actually may get more information on some of these risks and opportunities But I also know there's requirements to disclose if you have a lot of subsidiaries with different IROs. So how do you think about that as well? Yeah, so you're you're right that there is a a close connection between the way you decide to make your scoping for reporting and the way you will perform your double materiality assessment. Because the result will not be the same if you look at a standalone subsidiary in EU or if you are looking at an artificial consolidation Mm -hmm. or the ultimate parent consolidation. You will not have the same list. And usually we see an approach which is a top-down approach. Uh, So from the the highest level you're reporting from. Uh, But there is a need effectively to ensure that you are not missing one specific material impact or risk of opportunity which is specific to a subpart of, of your business. So you need... To, uh, to include uh, that level of, of granularity. All right. That's a very helpful reminder. And I think it's the same reminder that you don't say that your risks and opportunities balance each other out. So you don't risk disclose anything. And so if we then, um, how about some of these? So that was an E. How about anything from a social perspective? Another example. Yeah. Uh, another uh, example we, we, we could take uh, in the social field is the fact that the topic of product safety for a pharma company is likely to be material from an impact point of view. Uh, While well, you can have some public health impact if you have uh, severe secondary effects from one of your products. Uh, and from a financial point of view, significant risk if your product is banned, uh, you have to stop production, you have to impair all the related assets, cost to deal with litigations, class actions, blah, blah. So that's 
Another example. Yeah. So again, you have to think about both sides. This is not a a single dimension uh, consideration. So I know you've been, you mentioned obviously that you have a global methodology role, but I also know you are hands-on working with a lot of companies. So you have a lot of experience dealing with some of the issues that companies are facing. So what are some of the reminders that you would give in thinking about a double materiality assessment? I think the first point that is important to have in mind is uh, as opposed to financial statements where you have a financial standard telling you what you have to report. You have to report a PL with revenue, cost of goods sold, blah, blah, blah. You have a balance sheet, cash flow statement. With the sustainability reporting, you start nearly from scratch, from a, a blank sheet, and you have to define yourself as a preparer which topic are to be disclosed. Uh, so these are the so-called material topics like environment, subtopics, like pollution or sub sub topics like air pollution or, or water pollution. Materiality, this is a binary concept. Something is either material or isn't. And uh, materiality uh, is a, of very high importance as it is the basis of most of what you're going to disclose. You need to have that well done very early in the project to ensure you gather the right information. This is a key point. You need to have that right early because if you discover later that you missed something, it, it, it will probably be too late to have time to gather the right information. Um, we already mentioned the strong link linkage between um, double materiality process and scoping, so I don't come back on, on, on that. Um, also to be noticed that materiality assessment is not a one-time event. This will need to be updated every year. That being said, of course, the first-year process needs to be particularly thoughtful and robust. Uh, while there may be adjustments uh, year to year due to general changes in stakeholders' view in company events, it may be more challenging to explain less observable changes. For instance, if you discover a little bit late that your peers your industry peers do not report exactly the same thing as you, it may create concern about the quality of your process. Uh, maybe one point also I, I would like to precise is that there are two levels of materiality. This word of materiality is used for many, many uh, different things. Uh, we talk about materiality of matters or of topics. This is what I've just explained. It's based on IROs and the double materiality approach. But in ESRS, you also have the question of materiality of information. It is once you have identified a material matter, then you have to determine which are the disclosure requirements and data points that sit under that material topics. But it's a different notion. Um, maybe a, a, a last point at this stage on double materiality, which is important. ESRS requires preparers to disclose the process they implement to make their double materiality assessment. And assurance providers will need to conclude specifically on this process and its implementation. So that's why it's very important to make it right also. Yes, definitely important. Now, let me ask you a question about this two levels of materiality, because again, this is where we're getting a lot of questions. So now if I have concluded you use pollution and air pollution, for example, then you would then be determine which types of air pollution or what is sort of the next step in that assessment once I've said, okay, pollution is important and air pollution is important. So if you've determined that air pollution is important, you will go back to the topical ESRS, who is specifically dealing with that pollution. And this topical ESRS will give you a list of the kind of disclosure, qualitative or, or quantitative, that may be expected around that topic. And you will have to define what is relevant, what makes sense to, to select, uh, as you, you, you may know, that there are yes. a <laughs> huge potential list of uh, disclosure of data points that you may disclose. So the point is to select the one which are 
really relevant for, for your company and your topic. And I think that's such an important point. And we've talked here on the podcast before, we are always encouraging people to read things. And in particular, in this case, I think people really need to delve in to the ESRSs. And as soon as you start reading, what Cecile is talking about will make more sense because then you can kind of put these pieces together. But I do think it's important to not think, okay, I'm going to do scoping, then I'm going to do double materiality, then I'm going to dive into the ESRSs and understand what's required, because I think the understanding of what's required is very helpful as you're going through this process. Yes, yes. And you will find lots of useful elements within the topical ESRS to make your double materiality assessment. Because if we uh, go to that question of where the guidance is to, to, to prepare the double materiality. The first guidance is within ESRS 1, mm -hmm. which outlines uh, the four general steps to be followed for the double materiality assessment. So there are guidance on the methodology. But also then you, can, you need to complement that by the topical standards, which provide more granular aspects. For instance, the they indicate a list of subtopics that you have to consider and they can also prescribe specific elements. For instance, on pollution, they will ask you to look site by site. Mm -hmm. They will recommend some approach, like there is a LEAP approach for, for pollution. Um, so that's important, effectively, to have a read through all ESRS before starting. Um, and maybe uh, I can also mention that EFRAG is currently drafting a guidance on double materiality. We only have a preliminary version av available at that moment, but we expect soon to have a, a more refined one to, to support preparers. Yes, I'll have to have you back after we get that, Cecile, to provide more information. But, but I have a few follow-up questions on stakeholders, and you mentioned peers. But before we do those, let's um, finish sort of talking the bigger picture. And what one of the things I mentioned earlier was GRI, but let me also pause for the ISSB standards or the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards and how do you compare um, sustainability? How do you compare materiality <laughs> between the ESRSs and the ISSB standards? Yeah, so the ISSB framework only focus on financial materiality. It's also the case for the potential SEC yes. framework. Um, so they do not contemplate impact materiality uh, as opposed to ESRS. But let's keep in mind that many topics that are material from an impact point of view, inside out, are likely to also financially impact the company over time, notably mm -hmm. looking at the long-term horizon, which is required to be analyzed under the financial materiality. And increased regulation is notably one of the elements that right. often make impact materiality to also have financial materiality. I think that's such a great point. And we have also talked about that previously. These are not like two lanes on a highway and you only stay in, in one of them. This is, you know, more like water in a river, that it is all uh, commingled and that they really do impact materiality ultimately at some, you know, um, sorry, impact materiality ultimately would be expected over the longer term to have some financial impact. And so you really cannot view these as completely separate. Yeah, or you would have quite a very cynic view that you can do anything over your environment, your planet, without any consequences on, on you. All right, although to be fair, we probably do have some cynical listeners, but hopefully that you'll persuade them that of the importance of this. So the other one that I did mention was GRI, but maybe um, you can add a little more on that because I know FRAG, who developed the original ESRSs and um, GRI also have a, a joint statement. And so can you share a little on that? Yeah, effectively, they, they made a joint statement on their interoperability and uh, this John statement uh, says that ESRS and GRI definitions, concepts and disclosures regarding impact are fully or when full alignment was not possible due to the content of the CSRD mandate, closely aligned. Uh, so that's why I said uh, existing GRI reporters are very well prepared to report under the ESRS uh, 
lots of shared disclosure and high level alignments uh, is achieved. And I also think even for companies that have not been reporting under GRI, it's helpful to them to look at existing GRI, GRI reports for companies in their industry. Or otherwise, you made the point about peers, and it can provide some helpful information for sure, if you for read sure. those. So it's a good starting point for everyone. All right. So we talked a little bit about where in uh, the ESRSs you can find information on double materiality. So we don't have to run through that again. But now let's say I'm a company and I'm going to, I've read what I needed to in the SRSs. Maybe I've looked at some peer reports from GRI and otherwise. So now what should I, how should I think about next? Okay. So maybe one key point to, to, to start with. Double materiality assessment is not a simple reporting compliance exercise. It's strategic thinking. Double materiality assessment is the entry door into the all sustainability analysis, and the output is the reflection of the company strategy. So our more advanced clients are considering what governance they put around this specific double materiality ex um, exercise, and notably what should be the role of the board not only the audit committee, the whole board to validate the double materiality assessment and what is the right timing to do that, to have it early enough in the process. But to understand, let's go a little bit through the four steps uh, that are outlined in by ESRS 1 for the double materiality assessment. So the first step is understanding, and it's directly related to the strategy and the specifics of each client. It includes understanding the entity own operation and business model, but also, as I mentioned, it's value chain mapping, mm -hmm. the focus areas which are specific in this value chain. And you make a pre-definition, pre-identification on matters that are likely to be considered relevant for further IRO identification. And you have uh, at this stage also to identify relevant stakeholders and related engagement plan with these stakeholders. All right. And I do want to mention here, uh, pause briefly on value chain, because you mentioned the FRI guidance on double materiality. We are also expecting guidance on value chain because it's another area where there are a lot of questions. And for our listeners, we will have a future podcast that focuses on some of that because this is one of the most more challenging parts of implementing is your value chain can get very long, very yeah, fast. Yeah, it's not only tier one. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So, but the one of the the big questions again that we're getting right now as companies are delving into their double materiality assessment is this interaction with stakeholders. Because I think that's something people generally have a concept of from financial materiality. So, for example, in the U.S., we have something called SAB 99, which is SEC guidance on a financial materiality. And you do have to think about how the users of your report would consider an error when you're considering errors. This is way beyond that, though. And so I think it's a relatively new concept for non-GRI reporters. So how do you think about stakeholders? Yeah. So effectively, with the double materiality concept, you should identify the users, which is what you, you, you mentioned with the, the fin financial yes. approach. But also from an impact perspective, the affected stakeholders, including silent stakeholders like nature. Mm. So stakeholders you consider should be relevant to one or more topics. Um, you don't question anyone on everything. You should allocate the stakeholders by topic. Uh, and this mapping will be very useful to determine which group to directly involve in the materiality assessment. It, it is interesting to note that engaging with stakeholders is not compulsory according to ESRS. But let's be honest, there is a strong expectation that it will be done. Um, and engaging with stakeholders is not a bad perception. It's not just openly asking which topic they consider important. There is a need for more objective ask to compare and assess a broad range of ESG topics for in, from impact and financial perspective. It, it can be quite challenging because not all your stakeholders may have the maturity to go through that exercise. So that's this interaction, you need to prepare them very carefully uh, to get the right output. And to my view, 
stakeholder dialogue should not only be used to collect input for the double materiality assessment. There should be time for discussion around the strategy, policies and action plans for these topics. I think that's an excellent point. Let me go back to something you said about it, the expectation that it will be done, and because this is, again, a question we're receiving. And as you mentioned, have to disclose your process for double materiality, and that would include disclosing interaction with your stakeholders. And so to your point, it's going to be very notable if you have developed your double materiality assessment without any of this input. Yeah, effectively, just transparency is one element which made me say that there is a strong expectation. Uh, even if, again, it's not compulsory and you can use different ways to indirectly get their output. There are many uh, manners you, you can use by using a press release, uh, external report made mm -hmm. by these stakeholders. So it's not direct interaction. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing is, uh, and it, this is often framed as extra work or difficult or otherwise, but I think if you report this the right way, you mentioned strategy, this actually could be very helpful from a company perspective to be able to say, I have this huge spectrum of things I could be considering, but if I do talk to my key stakeholders and consider the silent ones, as you mentioned, it actually may help me focus my efforts more and and drive where I'm going to spend my time versus just this laundry list that no one has helped me prioritize. Exactly. And well, the feedback we, we had from companies uh, doing that exercise for several years is, is positive um, because effectively they get very value-added information from that dialogue that goes much beyond the, the, the need for reporting or, or compliance. And it's a very rich source of information for refining their, their strategy. Yes, yeah, so we need to reframe this, I think, as a benefit, not a, instead an opportunity, not a risk, maybe is a way to think about it. The other question, though, is that you started with, to make this point that there's a huge number of potential stakeholders because there can be layers to those as well, sort of like value chain. And so how are you seeing companies think about how to prioritize them or where to start? Or is it really company specific? Yeah, uh, it's, it's really company specific. And uh, while well, you... You have, of course, to make your pre-assessment of what you believe will be material or not uh, at the end, and you have to confirm that by your process. But effectively, that's why I said before uh, engaging with stakeholders, you need to have done this mapping by topic, saying, okay, they seem to have something to tell us about that element and that topic, effectively, we expect it should be material. So before starting the exercise, you, you should have started to identify the kind of thresholds or um, analyze mm -hmm. grid that uh, make you believe that something is material or, or, or not. I was thinking when you were making that point is that you don't want to be in a position that you did this analysis, you made your grid and you think, hmm, I'm not going to validate this or discuss it. So I do my reporting. Now your report is public. And what if your employees say, but that's not what's important to me. Or if your local community says, well, we're more concerned about the water than about the jobs or, or otherwise, they, you, you need to get that input so that you're not uh, caught off guard when you issue that report. Yeah, uh, of course, there will always be someone who has something to say. Yeah. You will never fulfill all expectations, but you need to have a rational way of explaining where you put the bar. That's what is important. That is a very key uh, statement here, I think, for people to think about this. So let's assume that I did do, I've just finished and I did do a good job with my stakeholders, or at least I feel an understanding of how to deal with them. Now, what do I do? So you have uh, understood the context. The second step of uh, the materiality assessment, according to ESRS1, is the identification of IROs. So you cannot talk only about the topic you prefer. So <laughs> ISRS gives you quite a long list of matters 
that you have to look at and you must also complement with entity or sector specific. Um, so none of the pre-existing list of matters is considered systematically material by ESRS. That's very important to, to note. It always depends on your double materiality assessment. Even climate can be considered non-material at the end of your assessment. But for this specific climate topic, if you conclude that it's not material, then ESRS standard requires you to explain why. So, uh, as I already mentioned, you can look at scientific and analytical research, prior assessments, peer screening, sector reports, industry standards, ESG rating scorecards, and many more sources of information. Internally, you can consider any pre-existing risk management framework, risk mapping, of course, engaging with stakeholders or experts. Think about including your value chain in mm -hmm. the analysis. Uh, and once you have this potentially long list of arrows, then you have to assess which one you're going to consider material. And again, it's not only about perception. You need to have an objective assessment methodology. Of course, there is room for judgment, but the standard impose criteria of assessment. And notably, you need to define thresholds. So that's important. Um, let's be clear. Guidances at the moment around how to define these thresholds are very limited. Lots of judgment around that point. But you need to put thresholds. And for impact assessment, you should assess the scale, the scope, the irremediability and the likelihood of the impact. And when you are considering financial assessment, you should assess the magnitude and the likelihood of the risk and opportunities. So... That enables you uh, to, to, to define that list. I already mentioned that, but you, the assessment should not usually be done on a net basis. If you have action plan, um, it does not prevent from assessing the problem. And you need to assess the opportunities, not only the problems, because the opportunities can also be material, hopefully. Yes, although I do think sometimes people focus more on the risks here, which is a natural starting point. Yeah. But let me ask you a question, though, um, because there are now some transition provisions in the ESRS, particularly for a company with under 750 employees. There's places that they would be able to um, delay some reporting or otherwise. And I don't know how many of our listeners would be in those situations, but how do you think about that in the assessment? You would still do your full assessment and it would just be when you came to the reporting that you would say that those areas are out of scope in the first years? Well, I would say there is not a single answer to, to, to that. Uh, my personal recommendation would be to consider everything at the beginning uh, even if you will not report on certain topics. But as you engage it that, in that exercise of analyzing reports, talking to stakeholders, mm -hmm. that's much more efficient to do all the double materiality analysis at once. Right. It's, it's very complicated if you start to pick out pieces not to include. So I would tend to yeah. agree with for, you. For me, the delay is more once you have identified what is materiality to get time to gather the right information, to have reliable reportings. But for double materiality, I would recommend to do that as early as possible. I 100% agree. And I think it's an important point to make that you don't want to to only do this part way because it's just going to create a lot of extra work later. And I think not having a holistic picture also is, is not helpful. Yeah. And also because you compare one topic to another, to if you don't look at all topics, it's difficult to really conclude that one yes. is more or less important than another one. Yeah. Yes. That's an excellent point. So then, so now let's assume you have done your holistic uh, assessment. You've included all of your potential risks and opportunities to talk to your stakeholders, et cetera. So now what do you do with the output? So the fourth and final step, determination of material matters. So you have concluded which arrows exceed your, your thresholds and are material. Then you map these impact risk and opportunities to the topical EF ESRS to identify which are the topical disclosure requirements. And within this disclosure requirement, as I previously said, you have to identify the specific information that you're going to consider material. So now you start to know 
what will be covered in your CSRD sustainability uh, statement. Remember that the materiality assessment is only the beginning of the reporting process. Maybe one point we can precise is that there is no prescriptive output in terms of visualization or the way to to show your double materiality assessment. But there is one big disclosure in terms of output, which is to explain in detail your IROs, the material one, and what are the consequences in terms of strategy and business model. So this is an interesting point because you just mentioned earlier, you do have to disclose publicly your process. So how do you recommend that people bring all that information together to disclose what they've done? And have you seen any examples or are people still working on this? Yeah, we have a lot of examples and lots of nice visual representation on diagrams. Um, so y- y- that's where it's interesting to, to see what uh, GRI issuers, for instance, yes. are, are already doing. Um, yeah, visual representation is often very, very effective. Well, and I would also think even just the output that you wouldn't necessarily be making public in terms of explaining your IROs and consequences on strategy, you need to have some comprehensive discussions with senior management and the board and finding a way to communicate that clearly is also going to be an important part of this process. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said uh, clients uh, are really thinking about the governance and the implication or, of either dedicated committees in their board or, or the old board because it, it is a uh, holistic uh, view mm-hmm. of, the, of the strategy. Yeah, and so you are seeing boards get engaged at that level. Yeah. yeah. All right. So then we've kind of, we've talked about this, but I think it's a good thing to kind of bring all those pieces together. So from your perspective, why is it so important to make sure you've done a very robust job throughout the four steps of this process? Mm-hmm. Um, so the first point is that, as I mentioned, you will have to be transparent about the process. It, it, it will become uh, public because ESRS 2 uh, says that the entity must describe an overview of the process. And it includes the methodology, the assumptions you applied, uh, what consultation you did with affected stakeholders and external experts, um, the materiality, all the material information was determined and notably uh, or you determine your thresholds, um, you must also disclose your internal control procedures, the decision-making process, or it integrates into your risk management. So that's a first reason to make it robust. But uh, also reporters really need to be deliberate in going through this double materiality assessment process. We are seeing some companies immediately default to the idea that everything seems important and mm-hmm. therefore everything is material. This this may be the case for some, but it is really necessary that specific consideration is given to each subject matter. If you're calling a topic material, but it never uh, made the cut for strategic prioritization, you did not develop a process mm-hmm. or dedicate resources, you may need to ask yourself if it's truly material for your organization or if it just seems like it should be. Yeah. yeah. So, well, if you say everything is material, then we lose the insight in what is truly material. That's something you, you already said. Uh, you take your highlighter to report and you proceed to highlight every sentence. Uh, at the end, you, you have not highlighted yes. anything. <laughs> so that, that, that's why it's important to have a robust process. And are you seeing then as companies are working through this, that it is having some impact from a strategy perspective that they identify that maybe they, they should have devoted resources or are we just not at that point yet in the process? Well, it, it really depends. We, we have uh, some companies that are very uh, well in advance in that process. I have not only in mind companies in the energy industry, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. course, we, and it must be. It can be very central in their strategy. Yes. Uh, and of course, for other preparers, they are just at the beginning of that process. Yes, yes. yes. And, and we need to, to keep in mind that CSRD is just a disclosure requirement, but of course, it has been created to influence the behavior mm-hmm. of companies. Transparency leads to changing behaviors. So, 
Yes, agree. And we've talked about that quite a bit. So before we wrap up, just a a few last questions. And I mentioned we've just been talking on the podcast about taxonomy. And definitely there's a lot to be done with the green taxonomy. Uh, But one of the things that was mentioned is that in the early years of the taxonomy reporting for companies already doing that, you do see big differences among peer companies. And you also mentioned thinking about peer companies here. And so I guess two two parts to the question. One is, would you expect we will, at least in the year, early years of the ESRS reporting, CSRD reporting, similar, that we'll see differences? And, and would you, is there any recommendation for companies to understand what others in their industry are doing? Um, so, yeah, I, I think we will not avoid a situation where there will be some inconsistency in the first years. Of course, that's why we encourage to have a, a robust process, but some elements um, do not fully support that process. For instance, you have the industry standards that have not yet been drafted right. and that will provide some additional insights and, and elements and guidance to uh, to the preparers in, in the coming years. Of course, we encourage uh, to have a deep screening of what peers are already disclosing to align uh, as much as, as possible. Uh, but for sure, there will be a maturing period for, 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 that, uh, for that reporting. Well, and I think the reason that's important and wanna, the reason I wanted to highlight the, that is that you said this before, this is not a one-time exercise. So you're going to complete it for your initial reporting, but you shouldn't expect that the next year will just be check the box and, oh, it must be exactly. the same. And and coming back to uh, the point we discussed on shareholder stakeholders uh, engagement, I think that's a very important ele- element that may secure your consistency with your peers Mm -hmm. uh, because they may be consulted by different actors in your industry and normally they should share the same concerns. So I think it's a good way to to prevent missing something which uh, will be considered material by by your peers. Definitely a lot of points that you've shared that companies can consider. But if we sort of bring it all together, uh, and I've said this a few times, I know you're working with companies now and we also have the experience from um, the NFRD reporting, which I know is different, but nonetheless, it's experience and then GRI. So what advice would you give to companies as you're talking to them? Yeah, so in terms of few practical steps, uh, companies should leverage on existing materiality assessment, of course, particularly those who were GRI reporters, Mm -hmm. as they must leverage their risk management processes at a starting point. Um, They should uh, consider the balance between a top-down approach and a bottom-up one to be efficient, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's important. Of course, not missing a material topic that may be specific to one part of the business uh, only. We talk a lot about uh, the intended involvement of external stakeholders to ensure that it aligns with, with expectation. We, we can clearly recommend to pick one value chain or portion of operation to do a pilot assessment to establish the methodology and the processes. That's very uh, useful. And as I am an auditor, I can only recommend companies to integrate traceability in the way they are conducting their double materiality process to allow for auditability. Um, You need to involve early enough your CSRD auditors Mm -hmm. in your process to get their confirmation that they concur with your approach because they will have to opine on it. So it's better to secure that early. Yes. Well, and especially I think in a case that's new to everyone, we saw this in the U.S. I'm dating myself here, but in 2002, um, when the SOX rules came out with the Sarbanes-Oxley rules, I think the cooperation between the auditor and the company, it made, went much, much smoother when you had that from the very beginning. And this is, again, a, a massive change in reporting. And auditors are also a way to make a kind of benchmark. Yes, that's a excellent. Another excellent reminder. Well, Cecile, you have so many um, important thoughts and helpful thoughts for people. So definitely appreciate your time and perspective. So thanks for joining me today. Avec plaisir. Thank you. And that's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes. 
so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.